people from, uh, from different parts of the world. So it could be a good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome all participants and panelists to this very special webinar in the lead up to this year's World TB Day 2016. This year's World TB Day is special because it is the first World TB Day after governments of countries of this world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, one of which is to end tuberculosis by 2030. Earlier at the World Health Assembly in 2014, the NTB strategy of the WHO was adopted, demonstrating strong political will to end TB. Yes, it is possible to end TB, but not if we do business as usual. In fact, Dr. Sahu of Stop TB Partnership said that if we do business as usual, TB will end in 2182 and not 2030 or 2035. We need to ensure that TB rates decline and decline faster than ever before, decline every day so that we are on track to meet the NTB targets. We cannot miss any opportunity to speed up the pace of TB decline. Making sure that the new TB drugs reach those in need is one of the urgent priorities. We today have experts who will tell us the progress we have made in rolling out new TB drugs such as Vedaculin and Delaminid, and the first ever child-friendly TB drugs launched at the 46th Union World Conference on Lung Health in Cape Town in December 2015. Before we begin and hand over to our panelists, let me make a few quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while panelists are presenting. No need to wait. Just type your questions using the chat function or else raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that we have good time left for question and answer. Thanks for your co cooperation. We also have Mr. Ashok Ramsarup a senior celebrated and award-winning journalist from South African Broadcasting Corporation, who hopefully I think he would be there to moderate the webinar. Hello, Ashok, are you there? Okay, I think he's, there, there's some technical problem as his end. So without any further delay, let me request our first panelist, Dr. Mario Raviglion, Director of the World Health Organization's Global TB Program, who is a globally acclaimed crusader for TB, to present. Over to you, Dr. Mario. Hello, Dr. Mario, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, so yes, please go ahead and welcome to this okay. webinar. And I will now show on the screen my slide so that I can make my yes. point. Yes. Can you see them? Uh, yeah, I can't see them as yet. But... Can you see can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So what uh, I'm going to do is uh, to speak a bit in this, or in this occasion of World TB Day, uh, about the TB burden, I will speak about the progress and response so far, and I will speak about the commitment that we must have to end tuberculosis. Let me begin with the usual slide I always use, which is uh, that of the global burden of tuberculosis to remind everyone what we are dealing with here. So we are talking about 9.6 million people getting sick every year, including 1 million children and 3.2 million women, making TB really a major pathogen of these, um, these, call it, population groups that are often quite vulnerable. And uh, if you look at the number of deaths, we are talking 1.5 million people dying of TB, including half a million women, making TB, I believe, is the third major cause of death among women. People don't realize that. And under them, 40,000 children losing their life to TB every year. On the second row there, you find the TB-HIV association, which means that 1.2 million of the 9.6, 12% or so, are in fact TB cases linked with HIV, causing some 400,000 estimated deaths, which means the number one cause of death among people living with HIV, 
HIV community often does not realize that. And finally, the last row, the big concern of everyone, nearly half a million new multi-drug resistant TB cases that do not respond to standard treatment and require more toxic regimens, much longer regimens, and much more expensive regimens. And perhaps about 190 to 200,000 of them die every year. Now, um, by virtue of killing 1.5 million people, including those 390 uh, MDR TB, uh, sorry, uh, TB uh, um, cases, tuberculosis is now the number one cause of death, right, in general, among infectious diseases. And it has surpassed uh, the uh, HIV AIDS uh, uh, condition as a cause of death. You have probably heard about it in uh, the occasion of the launch of our new report. It was the end of October of 2015, the latest one, where we actually uh, gave for the first time to the world the news that although tuberculosis is coming down in terms of deaths and in terms of cases, still now it remains the number one infectious cause of death. This is the uh, map of the world in terms of incidence. Uh, it's in uh, rates per capita. And what you see here is that the majority of African countries are uh, with, uh, uh, they run with a very high rate per capita of tuberculosis, the maximum being south, in southern Africa, between uh, South Africa, Lesotho, Brazilian, Mozambique. We're talking about nearly, in some cases, 1,000 cases, 100,000 people per year. Um, in the rest of the world, you see, there's not a single country has ever eliminated the The vast majority of people, low and middle income countries, suffer tremendously because of TB. Five countries are responsible for more than half of the TB, half of the 53 percent, nearly a quarter of the TB are in India, 10 percent each in Indonesia, that is now number two, and China, and 5 percent each in Nigeria. And in Pakistan, this is 53 percent. And once we look at the distribution, although Africa has the rates per capita the highest in the world, they have 28 percent cases. The majority of cases, most of the large populations, are in India, in China, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, meaning in Asia. Let's look at the lineage association. I mentioned already the 1.2 million cases and the um, You look at this map, you look at the prevalence of HIV, HIV people with TB. And what we find is that the epicenter of this whole epidemic, and in some parts of Africa, more than 50% of the cases of TB are HIV positive. Overall, 74% are in Africa. I would like to underline comorbidities that are popping up as responsible to maintain the tuberculosis in the world. One of them being diabetes, the other one being smoking, the other one being, of course, malnutrition. Malnutrition are all major causes of the Looking at the MDRTB, I mentioned nearly half, nearly half. 24, about three to four percent of new four percent of global. global. But once but again, like uh, in once the case again, of the we have an, uh, an area of the world, an area of the world. This time is not Africa, but it's that part of the world, i.e., the foreigners, where in some situations you might have one third of the cases, maybe 30 to 35 percent of, of that, uh, um, that are been uh, there uh, from the start. The start. All right. So I am told that there is a How do we do it? We want to connect via the phone. Shoba, can we can we can we can we connect Yes. All right. Do we have a phone number? Do we have a phone number?
Hello. Hello, Mario. Can you hear me? Hello. I think there's some technical problem at Mario's end, so we'll just give him some more time. Some technical glitch at his end. Okay, as we wait for Mario uh, to get back online, I would request the participants to please send your questions through the chat function or by raising your virtual hand. Continue. Yes, 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 Mario, you are there. We were just waiting for you. Please continue. No, it's the problem with the phone. No, it's the problem with the phone. Now we can okay. hear you. I'm going to continue. Earlier we continue. Yes. yes. While we try yes. to connect via my uh, assistant. Uh, assistant. Okay, yes. so. Uh, now, I want to speak now about the problems that you now there in the fight against TV. And I want to show you right away the fact that the Lenin development goal target that is of reversing them, reversing was reached because the epidemic because in the late in the early rather in the early rather started the decline which is unfortunately which is unfortunately 1.5 percent then the need to accelerate another important achievement during the millennial goal the the drop in mortality about seven percent since 1990 uh, as you see there, yeah, it's a uh, 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 level of the target that was set, of the target that was set. And as a result of this, tuberculosis, say, 43, uh, tuberculosis control, I should say, control, uh, some uh, 43 million lives between 2000 and 2014. Much more than interventions that are more recent, perhaps, uh, in HIV and malaria. Uh, in HIV and malaria. Now let's talk about the global commitment now to end tuberculosis. And I want to start with the concept of the Sustainable Development Goals. There is one of them, which is Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is devoted to providing good health and well-being to all at all ages, uh, to reach them by 2030. And we built around this uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the new NTV strategy. The NTV strategy as a vision of a world free of TB with zero death, disease, and suffering, and the goal of ending the epidemic, which we, in a way, consider as reaching the levels of rich countries nowadays. It is based on a number of prominent targets that you see over there. So what we want is by 2030, for instance, which coincides with the SDG targets, uh, to reduce the number of deaths by 90%, the incidence by 80%, and to have zero expenditure, catastrophic expenditure, catastrophic cost to patients and to families affected by TB, which actually should be in place as of 2020. Are you still hearing me? Yes, 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 we can hear okay. you. Okay, so I don't hear any more the echo. Did we solve the echo problem? Yes, you have. You have solved it. Okay, so um, these are the pillars of the NTV strategy and the four basic principles. So rapidly, the principles is that the government is responsible for ensuring that its citizens are uh, protected against tuberculosis. And that is what the government has to do, but there is a strong coalition needed here with civil society and communities, and there is a notion of promoting and protecting human rights, ethics, and equity. And then we insist on the fact that the strategy uh, is, uh, is uh, one of adaptation to country settings, which includes, as a starting point, the knowledge of the epidemic. So that's why we are saying map the epidemic, understand what we have available in terms of systems and where tuberculosis is really hitting. Then we have three pillars that are dealing with uh, uh, the three main elements of nowadays modern strategy, 
to fight diseases. The first one is the care part. And this is, if you want, is what we used to call the DOT strategy modernized. So it uh, defines all the principles of how, make, how one makes diagnosis and rapid diagnosis now, how one treats the disease, how one, how, how one can prevent the disease using chemoprophylaxis in, for instance, high risk groups. That is pillar one. Pillar two is that of the strategies and, uh, sorry, the policies, I mean, and the uh, systems that must be in place to guarantee that efforts against TB normally done through a national program are actually effective. If you don't have a health system that works, you can have any good national program and will not work. So the policies are insisting particularly on two aspects. That is uh, the universal health coverage that must be reached everywhere and the social protection mechanism that are crucially important to prevent those catastrophic expenditures I was referring to. And then it has other policies such as that of, for instance, uh, uh, mandatory notification or infection control systems in congregate settings. The last one is research, is in the recognition that without new tools, we are not going really to eliminate tuberculosis rapidly. So it, this, this uh, particular pillar insists on the participation by countries in research by setting up networks of researchers and defining proper priorities country by country. I want just to devote a, a slide to the notion that uh, um, there is uh, um, a momentum now that has been created in, in most of the 30 highest TB burden countries. And we uh, have issued today this report that is called Unite to NTB. You can get it, it's through the, uh, our website. You can see it. There are short, uh, crisp paragraph, country by country, that define what is being done. For instance, in the case of India, the expansion of, uh, of the capacity now to test patients uh, rapidly using GeneXpert or the rollout of Bedaquilin. In the case of South Africa, the access again to rapid molecular technology. Uh, in the case of Russia, a high level commitment and in fact a decline in incidence and deaths. And that, uh, in the case of Thailand, the access to treatment. In the case of Brazil and Vietnam, the research capacity building with very bold moves by the ministries. Um, to continue on, uh, on uh, my last part of the speech, these are the priorities for action. The number one is to ensure that the missed cases, and we'll go back to this in a second, are actually the system. The second is addressing MDR-TB as a real crisis. The third is acceleration of the response to TB HIV, especially in Africa. The fourth is making sure that uh, universal coverage policies, social protection co policies, are in fact now considering tuberculosis part of the agenda, which is not the case all the time. The fifth is that of intensifying research and the number of six and probably most important one overall is that of increasing resources, otherwise we cannot achieve much. Now, a couple of words on reaching the missed cases. We report six million notified cases, but we estimate 9.6 million. That gives you that gap of about 3.6 million. And we know that there are 10 countries responsible for the majority of this gap. Number one and number two being Indonesia and India. We believe that large part of these patients are in fact detected and perhaps treated, although we do not know the quality of this in the private sector. What is sure is that they are not notified. So this is a big issue that in the case of India in particular has to be addressed uh, uh, <coughs> and is being addressed uh, 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 as a priority, although much more needs to be done. The, the, the other big challenge and the crisis is that of NDRTV. I said that we estimate 480,000 cases every year, but only a quarter of them, 123,000, are reported uh, every year to WHO. And of those, 110, 111 are started on second line treatment. It means there is a gap there, which is an ethical gap of patients that are simply not put on treatment while we know that they are MDRTB. And even those put on treatment have a, uh, as you see, a cure rate of no more than 50% which means really that we need new tools and new ways of dealing with issues. Just a couple of words to talk about another co-epidemic. I'm not speaking much about TB HIV. I'm speaking now about the one on diabetes, also because on the 7th of April, in the next uh, two couple of weeks, World Health Day will be devoted to diabetes. We, we know that there are many, uh, literally half a billion people with diabetes now in the world, and we also know 
that 10% uh, of cases of TB may be linked to diabetes. So there is a huge amount of risks there when you have the coincidence of diabetes and tuberculosis, and we need, and we do have, in fact, some indication of what needs to be done to link these two diseases. And we do need countries now to really move on that front. And to sort of conclude, these are the research and the implementation gaps in money terms. We are talking between 1.4 in reality now with a new global plan, about $2 billion needed every year for implementation, and at least 1.3 billion for research. And I want to conclude by showing you this slide that comes from The Economist. So this is not the World Health Organization advocating or not some particular interest group advocating. This is The Economist. Last year, they looked at the, what they call the no-brainers. So where do we need to invest, really, as part of the sustainable development goals? And what you see over there is quite illustrative. You have trade liberalization that saves, or rather makes you gain, $2,000 for each dollar invested or access to contraception, which makes uh, each dollar invested worth under than $20. And when you look at the first real health intervention, you find reducing tuberculosis. And not only, but then they even adopted our own targets that reducing, by reducing TB deaths by 95% and incidence by 90%, you will have a return of some $43 for each dollar spent. So it's a no-brainer, and what is difficult to understand is why people are so late and delayed, often time, to understand this issue and to invest more. And I'm appealing here to governments, partners, philanthropists, you know, and research institutions, et cetera, et cetera. Much more needs to be invested in tuberculosis. And so with that, I'm, I'm, I'm reporting that, uh, that we are trying to do everything possible at WHO and uh, I conclude by saying, let us unite to end tuberculosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mario. Thanks very much. And now we move on to our next set of two panelists who will let us know how far have we progressed in rolling out new anti-TB drugs and how can we do better? Joanna Bredstein is Senior Director Communications at Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, more commonly known to us as TB Alliance, and her colleague, Shelly Malhotra, who is the Director of Market Access at TB Alliance. Over to you, Joanna and Shelly. Joanna, yes. Yes, hello. Uh, yes, we, we have moved you up in the order, Joanna. <laughs> Great. Hi, this is Shelly. I'm going to start out first. Um, and can everyone see our slides now? Yes. Hopefully. Okay. So, um, so as, as Mario mentioned, um, one million children each year develop TB, and that's more than doubled what was previously thought. Um, and another 53 million carry TB infection with risk of developing active TB. Um, and despite the fact that this is all preventable and treatable, 140,000 children die each year of TB. Um, and so while clearly TB is uh, an important cause of childhood mor 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 morbidity and mortality, um, it lacks attention and resources and it remains in the shadow. One of the key challenges that uh, we've seen is the lack of uh, optimal treatments for children with TB. So despite the fact that in 2010, the WHO uh, adjusted their dosing recommendations for children with TB, uh, we saw no manufacturers step up to produce the correctly do dosed formulations. So as a result, since then, children have been treated with um, you know, adult formulations that have been crushed or cut or, or different incorrectly dosed formulations that have been combined to attempt to achieve the desired dose. Um, medicines have been poor tasting, which has created challenges in terms of administration, um, and it's decreased adherence among children. So all of this has led to inconsistent practices and, and risk of inaccuracy in dosing. Uh, of children. So with investment from Unitaid uh, through initiatives uh, spearheaded by TB Alliance with WHO, our partner, 
Um, we have announced the availability of child-friendly medicines for TB uh, in the correct doses, uh, as recommended by WHO. Um, and these formulations are now available through the Global Drug Facility and also directly from the manufacturer, the first manufacturer who is McLeod's, um, and the second manufacturer is expected to come to market um, within a year. And these uh, FDCs are pending WHO pre-qualification, but they have been quality assured through the expert review panel process um, through WHO. An average treatment cost for a treatment course is about $15.54 for the three-drug uh, FDC and the two-drug FDC. And um, that's roughly in the same ballpark as current treatments. It's a little bit more than some countries are paying and a little bit less than others, depending on what products countries were using. So uh, with the formulations, we have the potential to move from a situation where kids were be being treated with tablets that were being crushed and sour tasting and incorrect doses to uh, the new formulations, which are fixed dose combination. They're dissolvable in water and they are also um, delicious. They're, they're fruit flavored and in the correct doses. So what's next? Um, now, uh, you know, with the product launch in December, um, we've been quickly uh, moving from product availability to uptake in the high burden countries. Um, and already we've seen so much progress, which is really exciting. Uh, the registration um, filings are underway in most of the high burden countries. And we've seen high burden, uh, a few high burden countries pursuing accelerated pathways, trying to access the FDCs, such as Kenya um, and India. Um, and registration has already been secured in India and Cote d'Ivoire, um, which is really exciting because India, I think alone, represents 30% of notifications for children globally. So that's a huge, important accomplishment. Um, Policy guidelines with WHO's leadership, policy guidelines have already been adopted in most of the high burden countries, I think with just a few remaining. Um, and we've seen countries really proactively funding for pediatric treatment in their um, global fund grants and in their budgets. Um, and so we've been really excited to see that. Uh, there have been gaps identified in the areas of planning for the transition. So, you know, the retraining, developing of dosing tables, developing of materials, costs associated with the change uh, to adopt the new product. And that's an area which we're hoping to mobilize additional resources. Um, in terms of procurement, we've already seen many, uh, a large volume of procurement with 30 million tablets ordered to date. Um, and to support the procurement process and the switch, the product switch, We've been um, working with partners to provide technical support to countries. Um, so support through our Management Sciences for Health, which is our partner, WHO, of course, and also uh, the Global Drug Facility. So while there's been a lot of progress, there's much more to be done, um, and everyone can play an important role, um, you know, from community at the community level with providers, just really um, integrating child health into, uh, integrating TB into child health screening, uh, inquiring about the availability of child-friendly treatments, and scaling up contract tracing of adult contacts to find more children um, in terms of governments and health programs, making sure childhood TB is included in strategies and budgets, helping to fast track product registration where possible, um, you know, implementing, uh, adopting and implementing the current guidelines as recommended by WHO, um, and proactively developing plans to adopt the product and phase it in, as well as scaling up other interventions. Child health advocates and civil society also play a role in terms of encouraging governments to um, accelerate the process of registration and adoption of the new products and advocating for a scale up of interventions. And of course, donors, um, by continuing to fund new treatments as well as introduction costs and supporting 
cost related, supporting the technical assistance needed to facilitate that transition. Um, I'm going to move on to pass the phone along to Joanna now, who's going to talk about uh, our campaign. Thanks, Shelley. Yes, this is Joanna Breitstein, Senior Director of Communications. Um, and thanks so much to Shelley for explaining a little bit of the background in terms of the availability of the improved childhood TB medicines. Um, as the TB Alliance and WHO, others, were working to make those medicines available, we knew that just having the medicines, while a big accomplishment in and of itself, is not enough. There's still a lot of work to be done to, in, to reach our collective goal of improved child survival and improved treatment from TB. You see here on this slide that 64% of children with TB are never even diagnosed. And I think with that number in mind, uh, you begin to realize what are some of the challenges that need to be tackled. So, um, you know, certainly to increase awareness and make sure that no child uh, dies of a disease that is treatable and preventable, we decided to launch a campaign called Louder Than TB. Uh, there are several tenets or pillars of the campaign. We're really working with global leaders um, to, join voice, to join forces with private and public sectors and media, including CNS, um, for their support to, to accomplish a few goals. Number one, to raise awareness of childhood TB as a critical issue and part of the global goals. You know, TB is, you need to tackle TB in order to end preventable maternal and childhood deaths. Number two, we need to promote the need for integration of TB into other maternal and childhood services. So really children with TB can be identified, diagnosed, and treated with the best solutions available. Uh, number three, we need to ensure that the most vulnerable have access to TB prevention. As Shelley said, 53 million children are said to be infected latently with the TB bug. And unless we do something about it, that will be our reservoir our of TB for many decades to come. And finally, and, and most importantly, Mario touched on this in his presentation, we need to drive further investment in innovation of new TB drugs, diagnostic tools, and vaccines. So this campaign will start on World TB Day, but it is intended to go for two years. Um, we have more than 30 partners. I'm just paging through the slides of some of them. And um, really from every sector, uh, civil society, donors, um, NGOs, uh, media, really all coming together to launch this important campaign. So I hope on World TB Day that you will look for the Louder Than TB uh, campaign. You will join our coalition of partners by uh, visiting our website. And certainly check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Post, share, follow. Really the idea is that we are calling on all people to raise their voice and join to, so that together we can be Louder Than TB and of course provide voice to the voiceless, which is children with TB. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna and Shelley. And we are all in together in your fight against childhood TB. Our final panelist is based in a country with the highest burden of TB disease, that is India. Dr. Jamie Tonsing is the regional director of Southeast Asia of International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the union. Over to you, Dr. Jamie. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry, I, I think I don't have proper slides like you all because I came rather late to this. But uh, I was more, I, uh, as asked by the organizers, I would like to touch on uh, the issues related to MDR TB and uh, a little bit discuss or take you through what the union in this region is. Uh, doing to address that problem. We saw the slide from Mario already describing the burden and what issues we face in terms of India TB. But you guys also probably know that India, the whole region in India is really not only the, has the highest burden of TB, but also India TB. And yesterday there was a World TB Day event uh, organized by WHO and Government of India, and we saw that 
There were exciting developments in the rollout of gene expert machines, uh, new drugs like Bedecurine that are coming into India under conditional access program. So these are all very exciting, but I think increasingly when we, when we look at MDRTP, we should also be thinking about issues beyond, uh, beyond the drugs uh, and uh, the diagnostics. And I think that's the point that I really want to highlight now, especially now that we're working very closely with many patient advocates, uh, trying to mobilize them in, in advocacy and communications campaign as well. Increasingly, what we hear from them is look at other aspects, whether psychological or social support or uh, other things that we need to do. And my plea really, because there are so many people who are influencing global policies and also at the national level is, what can we as a global community do to make sure these are not just things that are spoken about, but are actually practiced in, uh, in on the ground. And what occurred to me then was that, okay, when we talk about program management for drug resistant TB, when we're talking about financing for TB, uh, financing for MDR TB, are we looking at the cost that's required and then including them in our budget and not leaving it to the local district or state TB officers to find linkages with social welfare schemes or nutritional schemes? Um, a publication made by TB Care One with uh, KNCB, MSH, and WHO caught my attention recently. And what they've done is really put together uh, best practices policies on the kind of social support, emotional support, psychological support uh, that would help. And I think that's a very good booklet to go by. And there are examples from seven, eight countries. And I just want to touch on a few of them. And I think uh, clearly we now have the evidence to say that if you provide this psychological and social support, very likely that many patients who refuse to be started on treatment after diagnosis will get started on treatment. Mario had a slide about the waiting list or the gap between diagnosis and enrollment on treatment. And we know with evidence that when you provide, for example, counseling services, this gap tends to lessen. I think we have clear examples from Indonesia on how they made that happen in four PMDG referral centers. The second thing is really uh, in countries like Latvia or even uh, in Kazakhstan, we have clear examples from these countries on how social support like extra funds, transportation allowances, food vouchers, how all these things can lead to better treatment outcomes. In a small project that the union is doing in India with uh, Population Science International, we try, we, this was before the program decided to have counselors for India TV. In 30 districts where we work, we, uh, we train uh, healthcare workers and also some former TB patients on how to do counseling services. And though this was an initiative that was started last year, but we are already seeing that just through these trained counselors that are in place, so the treatment initiation has gone up, the loss to follow up has uh, markedly increased, decreased further, and from 18 percent earlier to 6 percent. And we find this very promising and then we're very happy also to know that the government now is thinking of providing counselors all over India. So those are the developments and I think the plea that I'm making on behalf of uh, the key patients uh, that we take this aspect very seriously and uh, advocate for this to be part and parcel of any MDR TV program uh, that we take into account. The other thing I was asked to speak about was on what the union's role is really in terms of MDRTB and AMDT in the region. And I would like to, I think, I've shared about our experience with the PSR and how we are doing this, uh, providing counselors and, and seeing better treatment outcome for MDRTB patients. Uh, the other exciting thing that's happening is the STREAM trial that some of you may have heard of, where um, uh, in the phase one of the stream trial, the, the nine-month Bangladesh regimen, as it is often called, was proven to be as effective as the standard 24-month treatment regimen. And this now is going to phase two, and we're hoping there will be one of the sites that participates into the phase two, where we have an all-oral drug regimen uh, for nine months with medicaline added instead of tanamycin. This, was, this is an additional arm that's going to be added in and on top of the nine-month Bangladesh regimen and the 24 standard regimen. 
The other arm is to really look at six months regimen where you add two months of clindamycin on an optimized background regimen along with the clean and see whether the six month regimen with injectable, two months injectable, and whether the all oral nine month drug regimen with the clean will provide the Good, uh, will provide as good results as we've seen in the nine months of the Bangladesh regimen in, uh, in, in stage one of the trial. So we're very excited that uh, the, the, that, that may be a possibility soon. We are hoping to, in the what, next one or two months, to get approval from the government in hoping there to be able to do that. The other thing is we are working closely with the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office and our staff from, the, from our office here are participating as in the regional NDRCB technical advisory committees, providing technical assistance to countries in the region. Under our own projects, we do many continuing medical education programs. I think in just in the past, we've done six such programs in different states of India, working with medical colleges and state TB controls there. Uh, I think many of you know, last week, many of you know about the international clinical management of drug resistant TB courses that the union does. This is for the, it's an international course, but we, in, in the South, mostly they're held in, in, in this region. This year we're going to have two such courses in Jakarta in April, and then another course in Bangkok towards the end of the year. This is uh, so we're very excited to be able to contribute, able to contribute to capacity building uh, in the region through these courses. We also have many customized courses for. In brief, I would say to summarize what the union is doing in terms of MDRT and BMDT in the region, and I think. Um, please do all of you to, yeah, to consider psycho, psychological and social aspects when we are considering the RTD management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jamie. Uh, we now move on to our question and answer session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand, which you will see on the screen. Uh, there is a question from Manfred Kaur Matharu. India, who is a social development consultant, and she wants to know what strategy is best suited for introducing the new pediatric fixed dose combinations in India, especially in rural India. Any progress made on this front? And by when can we hope that they will be rolled out? Has the, have, have they been rolled out in any country uh, till now? And what is the earliest when they will actually be available? Uh, Shelly, would you like to answer? Shelly or Joanna? Hello, is uh, Joanna there? Or even Jamie, if Jamie can answer. Oh, I'm not aware of the way. I have not heard discussions. Hello. Hi. Yes. 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 Hi. Hello. This is Shelly. Yes. Sorry. I think yes. we were muted. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Did you hear sure. the question? Yes. yes, I heard the question. So um, I think the plan in India is to first roll out the FTCs in a pilot in 100, 100 districts. Um, it'll be the first experience, I think, using FTCs in children in the public sector in India um, with daily dosing. And so um, after the 100 district pilot, I think the plan is to scale up um, nationally. So um, hopefully, we're, we're hopeful that that pilot will get started shortly now that the product is available and registered in India. Um, in terms of opportunities for engaging the community, I think um, the community really plays a role, a critical role in terms of making sure that children access care. Um, because we know that children are not um, presenting at TB centers, but they're, you know, they're presenting with symptoms of childhood illness that are often misunderstood um, and misdiagnosed. And so, um, you know, we've been working with UNICEF and, and with community members, uh, with community groups as well, to hopefully integrate questions about TB into some of the basic community health screening tools. Um, simple questions like, does, you know, a member of your household have TB? Um, or simple questions about some of the symptoms of TB in children 
can really be helpful in terms of making sure kids get linked with treatment. I think that's really where, as Joanna mentioned, where we're seeing the biggest challenge in terms of getting kids to even access treatment. Thank, thank you, Shelly. Uh, Urvashi Prasad wants to ask a question. Uh, Urvashi, uh, are you there? Would you like to ask your question, please? Um, yeah, um, so I wanted to ask a question on uh, social stigma. Um, what are some effective interventions uh, that we can use to tackle social stigma, which obviously in a country like India is a big problem. Um, we have seen awareness campaigns with celebrities and other uh, measures, but but what are really some of the most effective interventions that we can use here? Jamie, would you like to say something about that? That's a very tough question. I really don't have an answer on the intervention, but I do acknowledge that this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed. I think we need to look at more in depth what are the reasons that lead to stigma and what are the ways we can do that. I can also say that we have a, a, a campaign that was in fact launched yesterday um, with Amitabh Bachchan giving the voiceover for many of the radio strips. And we are planning a bigger campaign around that. And we are hoping like with people like Amitabh Bachchan coming on board and saying, look, if I can have TV, then anybody can have TV. And putting that out in the open that uh, yeah, this is something that can happen to anybody. It's something you can get uh, cured from. It's something that can be prevented. This will help uh, in a long way. But yeah, it is true that as a part of the larger media strategy, it's something that we need to work on to address the stigma. And the team here, our communication team here is looking at that issue on how best to get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a question from Martin Chivanda, who is from Malawi News Agency, Ministry of Information and Civic Education, Malawi. Uh, he has two questions. The first question is, TB cases are high in developing countries like Malawi. What interventions can be put in place to reduce them? And the second question is, what should the G8 countries do to ensure that developing countries are receiving enough funds to address TB. Mario, would you like to say something? There? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Very well. Okay. So thank you for this uh, crucial question. Number one, the what strategy we need to put in place. Malawi is obviously one of the highest burden countries in terms of rate per capita. The TB epidemic there is uh, really concerning, not only, but is very closely associated with that of HIV AIDS, which implies clearly the need not just to put together a, a normal approach, but to really uh, expand in, uh, in terms of the uh, intervention that are out there for, for TB HIV, uh, for the TB HIV Association. So the number one recipe, in a way, is the new NTV strategy. So that includes all the elements that I've described, and particularly in the policy element, that of in making sure that the TBHIV program work very closely together, because there are interventions, such as, for instance, prevention, chemoprophylaxis, in people who are HIV positive that can actually save their lives and not just go towards this one-third or so of the cases, uh, in fact, is 25 to 30 percent of the cases of AIDS dying because of TB. We can prevent the disease. We can also make sure that every single patient with can offer immediately antiretrovirals that can then save lives. So the answer to that question is very simply within the uh, various points of the new MTB strategy. And that is what the Malawi government should do at once. Just adopt as they sign off with all ministers of health at the assembly, World Health Assembly time when this resolution was discussed and this strategy was discussed and now implemented. Regarding the G8, absolutely. Now I mentioned that the, uh, the G8 and other funders, I should say, I mentioned that um, in fact uh, uh, there is a huge gap in terms of uh, uh, money that uh, needs to be uh, put or invested in TB research and in TB control. Uh, for what concerns control, 
meaning implementation of the elements we have in place and we have in place now, ensuring proper care of people, meaning promptly diagnosis and uh, prompt diagnosis, sorry, and uh, uh, proper treatment. Um, then countries like Malawi, who are the, uh, which are the, among the poorest in the world, will need for the next uh, several decades, in my view, uh, international support. There are institutions such as the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria that are out there just to guarantee that countries like Malawi receive proper uh, support. What the problem is often time, especially in African countries, is that tuberculosis in, is not well represented in the CCMs in the countries, i.e. the political bodies that make decisions about proposals and projects to be programs to be submitted to the Global Fund. And tuberculosis being underrepresented, the rest is dominated by, say, HIV or malaria constituencies, and tuberculosis gets forgotten. So this is a very common uh, uh, event. That's why we only, in TB, receive 18, one, one eight, 18 percent of the uh, amount of funding that the Global Fund releases to poor countries. So these are the type of political issues that need to be faced at the country level, ensuring that there is enough mobilization of people and of ex-patients and current patients to fight in such a way that it is better represented. And going straight to the G8, the G8 are the ones that finance mostly the global fund. A lot of money comes from the G8 countries, especially the United States and the UK. And so ensuring that those countries have in mind all the time tuberculosis as a major problem for development and for health, then is paramount. And the discussion at the G8 is the one that influenced at the beginning the uh, creation of the Global Fund and must continue year after year and making sure that tuberculosis is well represented. Thank you, Mario. Uh, just to remind all ourselves, uh, one of the greatest leaders from South Africa, Nelson Mandela, who himself was a t who had survived TB years back, had wisely said more than a decade ago, we cannot win the battle against AIDS if we do not also fight TB. Well, we have finally, uh, Mr. Ashok Ramsarup is there online, who is an award-winning journalist from South African Broadcasting Corporation. And I think he would like to ask some question in connection with World TB Day this year. I am sitting right here at the Durban International uh, Convention Center. That's going to be the major hub of the World Summit, uh, uh, World AIDS Summit that will take place in July this year. But the, my, the most important question that I like to ask is TB is one of the biggest killers in the world today. What are some of the challenges faced uh, to rid the scourge of the disease? You want me to answer that one? Yeah, anybody, anybody, yes. yeah. I missed one word. You said, what is the biggest challenge? No, TB is one of the biggest killers in the world. Yes. What are some of the major challenges faced to root the scourge of the disease? Oh, okay. So, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, TB is actually the number one killer in South Africa, I believe, among adults nowadays. And uh, um, clearly, uh, there are some major challenges. I highlighted that in uh, one of my slides, but let me just go through them uh, quickly. The first one is yeah. that we, yeah, the first one is that we do not have in the system, as let's say officially, formally diagnosed and notified, about one third of the cases of TB that we estimate exist. So that gap is huge and is important to feel for the simple reason that we do not really know what happened to this kind of this kind of people some of them may actually not be diagnosed at all i wouldn't be surprised if a huge number of those especially in rural africa are not recognized that stb which is a curable disease and are simply in a way uh, uh, exchanged for uh, late aids patients that are dying at home this is very sad and we know from autopsy studies especially in africa that tb is often non-recognized during, uh, during life of a person with HIV. So we need to strengthen the diagnostic capacity. That is a huge challenge. And we need to ensure that every single patient gets to the proper system of care and uh, gets the right drugs for the right period of time. So that is the number one challenge, I would say, followed by then the big issue of MDRTB, which I highlighted and everyone is talking about. And that is an issue that has to be faced with very 
critical interventions, having laboratories that have rapid molecular tests, like South Africa is doing now, uh, having uh, treatment available for everyone. And this is a major issue because, as was illustrated by me and by others during this, uh, this webinar uh, connection, uh, there are some 10, 15,000 people with MDRTB that have been diagnosed and not placed on treatment last year. That's an ethical issue. So it's a, it's a big problem. The third one is that of TBHIV, and I already mentioned a few, mentioned a few interventions just before this, uh, this question uh, about the need, for instance, for testing every TB patient for HIV to offer antiretrovirals, or to make sure that every single person with HIV, when he or she visits the doctors, the clinic, then a few basic questions are asked to detect TB if that is the case as quickly as possible. And then we have the big challenge of making sure we have a research pipeline that delivers new diagnostics, new drugs, eventually a vaccine. That implies a major investment in research, participation of governments, and you are lucky in a way in South Africa because you have a government there that is quite, and, and, and institutions, not necessarily the government, and institutions that are actually very uh, prominent in uh, global TB research activities for new vaccines or new trials for diagnostics and so on. So this is the kind of attitude that we need in order to be able globally to develop what we need to uh, fight TB effectively, eventually eliminate TB. So there are many challenges at all levels. In the end, it comes back to uh, not having enough resources to fight the number one killer in the world. If I look at, H, and, uh, at AIDS and HIV and even malaria, I find that the investments in those two diseases are much more prominent and similar to what the burden of these diseases are. If you take TB, you know, normally TB receives a 10th or a 20th in terms of investment by domestic resources, or by domestic sources, or uh, internationally then, uh, say, HIV AIDS. So this has to be corrected. And I'm not saying to take away money from these other conditions that are killers, but to increase dramatically what we have and what we need uh, in tuberculosis. Well said, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, one question from Tarit Bose, a journalist from Kolkata. Again, for Mario. It is very positive to hear that ending uh, the catastrophic health expenditure is part of NTB strategy. Please, can you tell us if countries are beginning to move in this direction to meet the goal by 2020? Crucial, important question. We don't put yet enough emphasis on this issue. As part of the new strategy, we linked very closely with the uh, main agenda in global health, that is of ensuring what we call universal health coverage and uh, social protection. TB is a chronic disease, is a disease that lasts at least six months, let alone, you know, the MDR TB cases that may last two years or more. So people lose their salary, right, during this period of time. So it's not just an, an issue of universal coverage with health services that allow one, one that has cough and fever to access proper, you know, clinics, be diagnosed and then be put on treatment without spending money or in a, in a disproportionate way money that, that, that next day the person is a poor. Uh, but at the same time, we have to think about social protection because that requires the compensation, so to speak, the buffering of the loss of income of these people. And these people are the poorest among the poor. It's not the rich people normally that get tuberculosis, are the poor living in slums. So if we don't correct this, this situation, if we don't guarantee universal coverage, that takes care of medical costs and even indirect costs like transportation and things like that. And if we do not take care of social protection mechanism, then we are going to lose this war against tuberculosis, no doubt, because people don't have simply the resources to do it. So now, are there countries? Well, some, some countries are like Thailand or even Rwanda. These are good models and examples of countries that have put in place universal health coverage and guarantee that the people affected, the poorest particularly, do not lose their money in a disproportionate way becoming poor. So this is a big issue, is a big policy issue that implies going beyond the Ministry of Health capacity. Normally decisions on social protection or even universal coverage depend on Minister of Finance, they depend on the Prime Minister, they depend on Ministry of Social Welfare and other parts of the government that truly must be now, um, I, I would say, pushed and pressured in such a way that we can then come to that point. Without it, I consider it impossible to really progress in a more rapid way. We have seen the notion of having this mechanism in place in Europe 
in, uh, say, immediately after the World War, World War II, so in the 50s and 60s, where the decline of TB was very important, not just because of development, but because as part of development. You know, these countries, as like my own country, Italy, these countries, even if Italy was poor after the war, they established mechanisms to ensure that people will not get poorer because of their disease. And TB, in my view, is the most classical example of the disease of the poor. So if we don't have this mechanism in place, if we don't have the politics and the people pushing for them, then we will not win this battle. Thank you. Uh, Victor Motori from Pamoja FM in Kibera, Nairobi, wants to know that uh, African governments are often saying that prices for, M for MDR-TB drugs are very high. And uh, what measures are being put in place to reduce the prices of these drugs in developing countries? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can just add to the question, I think. I, I wonder why we question the cause when it comes to a disease like TB. Is it because it's not it's considered a disease of the poor and people don't really care because they think it doesn't affect them? I'm talking about people at the policy level. I don't see people uh, questioning the cause of what it, what it would take to put a person on ART for life. In fact, a poor country like India, just yesterday they announced the introduction of third-line drugs for uh, people with HIV AIDS. So when there are resources available, in, even in very resource-constrained uh, countries for other diseases that take up a lot of more money, I don't think we should be, uh, I don't think it's fair to question the high cost of India TB. It's a disease, not only for the patient, it, it also has cost to the society because it's yeah, it's something that strong, uh, that's, an arm, that's transmitted through the air, through your breathing. It can affect everybody, everybody's at risk. And so when you look at all those costs, I'm sure it's, I think there are arguments, even, even from the economic angle to say that, yeah, looking at the, uh, what you can prevent in terms of the spread of MDR, TB, and what it would take to say that this is not costly. So yeah, I think we should have very good counter arguments to say that it is not costly and be prepared to answer that with, with, with figures that we are confident of. Yeah, if I can add, I, I, I fully agree with that. Um, there are several issues here. Number one is that of the, of the cost itself, all right? So if you are in Europe, as, as an example, and here, here in Europe is not the rich people that get to be, right? Are the poorest, are the migrants, are the you know, uh, homeless and so on. Yet bedaquiline will cost you $30,000 for six months of treatment, just, just one drug let alone then the full regimen that includes some other drugs that are, if not that, that expensive, you know, equally, equally expensive. So we still have an issue with the, with the high cost. And uh, in the case of bedaquiline, for instance, there has been quite a good um, intervention by uh, uh, the, the drug company, Johnson & Johnson, in collaboration with USAID to provide these 30,000, to start with, 30,000 regimens free of charge to countries in need. And I believe, uh, uh, some of the countries are getting uh, pedaculin through this type of mechanism. So uh, the, the, we need this, that type of approach. Um, and we need at the same time to create the market dynamics which are correct and which are good that uh, will allow some of these drugs at least that are still expensive, cyclosirin, capromycin, to have a price which is more acceptable. But then we have the issue that, you, that was just raised, i.e. that of the perception of the high cost and the fear or concern by governments, by many, to embark on the treatment of MDRTB. That requires really, in a way, is connected to my previous statement about the fact that people yet do not recognize that this disease is a public health pro problem, it can infect everyone, and it needs to be really tackled in a way, in a crisis mode. That's why we call it an MDRTB crisis at WHO. If uh, governments don't move, if the private sector doesn't move, if no one moves, which has been the case in many instances, in many countries over the past decade or so, we will always have MDRTB that is not taken care of. And I consider that actually a scandal because like you, I believe, I believe that once we have a, a, a patient with MDRTB, we should provide all possible you know, uh, uh, resources to make sure that these people are not just diagnosed, but then treated. So it's a big issue and requires political will. Without intervention at the highest level, 
that is not going to be solved. I'm aware of uh, you know, meetings at high level where they discuss antiretrovirals all the time and access to antiretrovirals, which is crucial to save lives. But I'm oftentimes asking, why don't we discuss tuberculosis that is the number one killer among people living with HIV when we have this type of high level meetings with CEOs of the industry, for instance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamie of the Union and Dr. Mario of the WHO for answering that question. Very important question. One last question uh, from a journalist from uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Catherine. She says, in Zimbabwe, we had, uh, have an upsurge in multidrug resistant TB. And for most patients, traveling from home to the health facility for treatment is, is difficult. Though they have mammoth challenges, particularly if they are living far from the health facility. And if this is not addressed, we could have more people having MDR-TB in the near future in my country, which is surely undesirable. So how do we handle MDR-TB cases in Zimbabwe, particularly when they fail to travel and adhere to treatment? Mario, can you say something? Yeah, well, very difficult question. When you have a country that has poor transportation or a country with mountains, with uh, uh, steps and whatever, that really put you in a difficult situation, then uh, the only solution is, of course, that of once you make a diagnosis of a case, ensuring that this person goes back home, because normally this, this type of diagnosis is made in hospitals, oftentimes, but then ensuring that these people go back home and uh, ensuring, therefore, that the system is in place to allow the proper support to the individual that is taking these drugs for months. And that implies uh, in using for instance, like I've seen in Ethiopia in uh, November uh, last year, using a, a primary care system made by, in that case, what they call health extension workers, i.e. 40,000 women that have been trained for about one year each uh, in, uh, in Ethiopia to become, call it paramedic or semi-nurses that are there in the very peripheral places in small health posts. And that can then motivate the villagers, the people living in villages in very rural Ethiopia, which is 80 or 90 percent of Ethiopia, for instance, you know, doing that type of training then of community workers, community volunteers that based on these health extension workers that are equipping a health post can then be unleashed in the community and support the people. That is the only, the only real way we can deal with the difficult situations of that type. I mean, making sure, of course, that patients are fully supported and understand, counsel, and understand that uh, TB drugs can produce side effects for MD when you treat MDR-TB, and they should then uh, uh, really look at, uh, at uh, proper care anytime there is a problem. And that can only be done if you have this very grassroots uh, type of community organization that are out there, and that can guarantee uh, proper, proper support. I think that's the real only practical way to deal with the issue when the health services are scarce, and they're not really distributed as they should. Okay, thank you. Now I promise this will be the last question. We have Amit Ukil, a very senior journalist from West Bengal, India. He wants to ask a question. Amit, please ask your question. Hello, Amit. Is, is Amit there? Hello, Amit. Okay, uh, is he the if I can ask his? Uh, he has sent the question. So his question is: Why is bedaculin being made selectively available in in India? Not all states will be getting the drug, even though there are XTR TB cases, like for example in West Bengal. I can tell you what I heard yesterday when the bedaculin launch happened. Uh, that initially, because this is a new drug and we want to protect it, we are making it available only under the conditional access program. We don't want the history of rifampicin that was available many years back and to which we're seeing resistance now happening. So we want to protect all new drugs, right? But that is the, uh, the rationale for which government is introducing in six sites, in uh, six different cities covering all regions. And so, but the, the, the understanding is also that these are available in these six sites, which are most of them are medical colleges. But that, it is like a hub and spoke mode. And so if there are people who are from that state or adjoining state, 
who need that medical aid, that people will be able to get it from these six centers. Eventually, they want to, they're looking at how these six sites will fare, they're looking at the demand that will come from the field. And we heard Johnson and Johnson or, uh, yesterday saying that depending on the need, they're willing to look at additional doses that they're do donating to the program initially to India for these six sites. I think that's 3,000 doses that they are donating to begin with. Okay, thank you, Amit. That was Jamie Chonsing, Director of the Union Southeast Asia, who responded to your question. Okay, now we will end. I think we've already exceeded the time limit by a few minutes. So now India is celebrating their festival, colorful festival of Holi tomorrow, which is basically a festival of friendship. So let us hope, let us end on a positive note. Let there be friendship. Let there be peace in the world not more incidents than what happened recently in Brussels. And let us all stand united and fight against TB. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.